Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Good evening and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We have some great guests for you tonight. Uh, Aaron Smith with the National Cannabis Industries Association is here. He'll be talking about a new uh, lobbying uh, group that represents uh, the emerging cannabis industry. We also have uh, Nevada physician and psychiatrist Stephen Fry. He'll talk about his book, which includes 25 reasons that uh, drugs should be legalized. We'll be having both of them on. Tim Pate is standing by in the wings. Good evening, Tim. Hello, Paul. How are you tonight? Very, very well. Good. Very well. This is show 599. We're closing in on our 600th show. Uh, we'll be back with brief hemp news segment, then we'll be taking your calls and questions. So stay tuned as we bring on our infamous dancing cannabis leaves. I feel the force. Our first story tonight is from Little Rock, Arkansas. Criminal sentencing reform legislation passed by Arkansas lawmakers earlier this year is now in effect. Arkansas Bill 750, the Public Safety Improvement Act, intends to reduce the number of nonviolent offenders incarcerated statewide in Arkansas by mitigating the sentences for certain low-level drug offenses. Arkansas's Democratic Governor Mike Beebe, who strongly backed the measure, signed it into law on March 22, 2011. The law took effect on July 27. Specific to marijuana law enforcement, the measure amends cannabis penalties so that the possession of up to four ounces of cannabis is a criminal misdemeanor, punishable by up to one year in jail and a $1,000 fine. For first-time offenders, the new law states, quote, the court, without entering a judgment of guilt and with the consent of the defendant, may defer further proceedings and place the defendant on probation for a period of not less than one year, end quote. Under the previous law, the possession of any amount of cannabis above one ounce was a felony offense punishable by between four and ten years imprisonment and a $25,000 fine. The new Arkansas law additionally reduces criminal penalties for the possession of small quantities of marijuana with the intent to deliver from a felony offense to a misdemeanor. Law also reduces subsequent marijuana possession offenses from felonies to misdemeanors. Previously, second and third cannabis offenses, uh, possession offenses were categorized categorized as felonies. Defendants found guilty of violating Arkansas's marijuana laws will still be subject to the loss of their driver's license for six months. That is a requirement from the federal government. The federal government has forced all states to suspend driver's licenses for six months upon a marijuana conviction. Out of Washington, D.C., the United States Drug Enforcement Administration, or the force of evil as I like to call them, or DEA, has issued its final order rejecting a 2007 ruling from the agency's own administrative law judge that it would be in the, interest, the public interest to grant the University of Massachusetts a license to grow marijuana for federally regulated research. The re rejection preserves the monopoly held by the United States National Institute on Drug Abuse, or NIDA, on the supply of marijuana for FDA, or Food and Drug Administration, regulated research. In a 2010, a spokesperson for the agency told the New York Times, quote, we generally do not fund research focused on the potential beneficial medical effects of marijuana, end quote. In a 2007 uh, hearing, DEA Judge Mary Ellen Bittner opined in favor of allowing a researcher at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst legal permission to cultivate marijuana for use in FDA-approved clinical trials. She determined, quote, there's currently an inadequate supply of marijuana available for research purposes. I therefore find the respondent's registration to cultivate marijuana would be in the public interest, end quote. DEA Director Michelle Leinhart initially set aside Judge Bittner's ruling in 2009. The agency's ruling may be appealed in the First Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. 
Our uh, next story tonight is from Rochester, Minnesota. The administration of synthetic THC, or Dravenol, decreases colonic motility compared to placebo in patients with irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS, according to clinical trial data to be published in the journal Gastroenterology. Investigators at the Clinical Enteric Neuroscience Translational and Epidemiological Research Center in Rochester, Minnesota, assessed the impact of oral THC versus placebo in a randomized trial of 75 patients with IBS. The researchers reported that active THC decreased motility of the large intestine during fasting compared to placebo in all the study's participants. Drabinol administration yielded the most significant results in IBS patients with diarrhea and in subjects with alternating diarrhea and constipation. The researchers concluded, quote, Dravenol may provide potential benefit to those IBS patients with accelerated transit, end quote. Dravenol is presently a Schedule III controlled substance. It's approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for the treatment of severe nausea and cachexia, or wasting syndrome. Irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, refers to a disorder that involves abdominal pain and cramping, as well as changes in bowel movements. It's a condition, uh, a different condition than inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD, which includes Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Earlier this month, survey results published online in the European Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology reported that patients with IBD commonly use cannabis therapeutically. The full text of this study, pharmacogenetic trial of cannabinoid agonist shows reduced fasting colonic motility in patients with non-constipated irritable bowel syndrome will appear in gastroenterology. That's the end of our hip news segment tonight. Now we'll jump over to Mr. Tim Pate. What a title, that last story. That is, that is. Wow. It's a mouthful, isn't it? That was impressive. And you got it out. I'm reading along with you. I was watching the monitors like, that was Practice good. makes perfect. It does. It does. That's, that's important, especially for so many of our friends who have that issue. And you know we do. We, we see a lot, a lot of, of patients like that. with that condition. I'm certain that's true. And, you know, we just have so many. Well, we're going to have an opportunity next week to see a lot of our friends up at Hempstock. Because so, it's coming and it's right around the corner. And all of our friends show up. And, and those of you who have that problem. It's a, it's a real problem, so I'm glad that there's that we're finding some solutions among uh, all this wonderful plant that we have around here. So anyway, speaking of wonderful plant, uh, I think I'll play some music and they'll show some on the TV. Yep.
Tim Pate. Thank you. Here on Cannabis Common Sense, that's uh, Tim Pate. Maybe we'll get over to camera four here. Um, okay. Hey, that's the right one. So welcome, Tim. Oh, thank you, Paul. And we have our guest, Aaron Smith. You're with the you're the founder of the National Cannabis uh, Industry Association. That's right. Thanks for having me, Paul. Thanks for coming up. And we also have Dr. Hey. Stephen Fry. You're a you candidate for Congress in Nevada. That's correct. And you're a psychiatrist. That is correct. And it's I've got you your yourself. your letter here. You're a former Green Beret in the U.S. Army? That is correct. Was that back during Vietnam? It was, but I took care of the returning troops. I was fortunate enough that I did not have to go to Vietnam. And oh. you're the author of a book, 25 Reasons Drugs Should Be Legal? Well, the book is actually called We Really Lost This War. The subtitle is 25 Reasons to Legalize Drugs, and each of the 25 chapters is by itself a standalone legitimate reason put together they're overwhelming. I, I believe that. And you were a professor at the University of Nevada School of Medicine. I was. That's great. And so you must have taught psychiatry. That, there, would, that, psychiatry. Would, that would, would be the only thing I would be. I, I would have loved to have taught horticulture, but that's not my thing. <laughs> I understand. I understand. So that, I think, perfectly prepares you for public office. Uh, well, I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> <laughs> and so you are running for public office I, in Nevada. Yes, I have to say that I, uh, that I have a, 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 uh, an exploratory committee. Okay. Because legally, that's what you have to stay at this stage. But there's no of course. question that we'll take the next steps and subsequently move on. Yes. And which party? Democrat. Okay. I am a Democrat, and I have a. Uh, is it an open seat, or is it held by a Republican? No. Or well, you... right now, because of Nevada's redistricting, we got an additional seat, and there's redistricting. Uh, we're not sure how it's going to be, but of the three um, seats that we have, only one is currently occupied by a Republican. So two are open. I see. I see. Great. Well, Thank good. You. Have a good run. You know, we I'll take viewers. Support. Excellent. Yeah, we're glad to have you on here. We take viewers' phone calls. If you have a question for us tonight, you can call us at 503 288 4448. That's 503 288 4448. That number that just popped up on your screen. And we do have a caller standing by. Welcome to the show, caller. Hello. 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 Hi there. I'm a community member who would like information about perhaps volunteer opportunities that can help community members um, fight the stigma around medical marijuana, maybe spread some awareness, um, just ways that active community members who are maybe not um, participants can show their, their support. Well, you know, there are several ways you can do that. We have a petition drive right now that we have over 32,000 signatures on. We need uh, a total of 80 uh, 7,232 valid registered Oregon voter signatures to qualify that for a ballot. You can go to uh, that website right there, CannabisTaxAct.org. We also have a big event coming up next weekend, the Hempstock Festival, and it takes a lot of volunteers to put that on. So uh, we're preparing for that, and if you're interested in finding out more, you can call us at 503-235-4606. That's 503-235. Two three five four six zero six. That help? Great. Thank you so much for that wonderful information. I know there's a lot of us active community members that, you know, just want to again dispense the stigma around mm -hmm. around the use of medical marijuana. Great. So well, that's what we try to do. You know, we've helped uh, thousands of patients obtain uh, recommendations from doctors for medical marijuana, and in fact, this is our. 599th show in our Cannabis Common Sense series since October of 1996. So we're out here trying to educate people. But thanks for your call, and please pick up our petition and uh, uh, come to our Hempstock Festival next weekend. It's September 10th and 11th. Where is it located? It's out at the convergence of the Willamette and the Columbia River, the two largest rivers here in the West. And so you go out to Marine Drive, uh, near Jansen Beach, and you head west about four miles, and it's at the end of the road. And we have parking available, and uh, should be a great show. It starts at 10 a.m. and runs to 8 p.m. on next Saturday and Sunday. So we have a number of bands, speakers. Come on out and meet us all. Great. Thank you so much for your show. It's very encouraging to see this kind of program on. Thanks. Thank you. You know, I'd like to encourage, I'd like to reiterate what Paul just said in that a few weeks back, we had the privilege of standing in front of a lot of people at Seattle Hempfest. I mean, it, it's, there's nothing like standing with that many people who all agree 
the way you do that this should be changed. These laws are draconian and insane. And so uh, this hemp stock will be the same way. I urge you to come out and, and stand among all the rest of us here in Portland who agree with that philosophy and want to make that change. And that's how we do it, by standing together. It's a strength in numbers that really does matter now. So Aaron, you were there at the Seattle Hemp Fest as well, and you got to meet a lot of different people. Now you've started a new organization. You originally worked with the Marijuana Policy Project and was your California coordinator for a number of years. That's right. Um, and in those years working in the uh, cannabis movement, I've seen a beautiful industry emerge. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there's now a legitimate industry in several states across this country. Uh, that mean that what that means is that we now are employing thousands we're, we're employing thousands of good paying jobs paying millions if not hundreds of millions in taxes which local governments are depending on uh, propping up the real estate market in some cases uh, mm -hmm. with with cultivation of medical cannabis and it's just about time that this industry be treated like any other so what we're doing is we are establishing uh, uh, industry lobby in Washington DC to work on behalf of these business owners and the businesses in this community so that they can be respected uh, just like any other small business. And you have the support I know of uh, it's the United Food and Commercial Workers Union Local 5 is that that the UCW Local 5 in California uh, has... They're a major union, obviously. Yeah, they're, they're the union that represents uh, the, the, the clerk at the grocery store. Um, they, they are uh, advocating for a reform of these laws because they know that legitimizing medical cannabis will create jobs. And rather than having this in a black market where it's completely unregulated, we don't know if people are even being paid uh, in some cases, uh, what, this, what this does is it replaces that with a legitimate market um, that means jobs, which means payroll taxes, corporate taxes, and uh, all those good things that help our community. I sure. pay a lot of those payroll taxes in our clinic business, that's for sure. Well, they'd have Lots to go others. after the, uh, the, you know, the tax laws that, are, that have really affected most of those businesses here in the past year because they, they decided to clamp down on that. And you're working on and that, So that's right? what on you're these, working on, right? These banking yeah, laws so one of the, tax laws. Yeah, we, as an industry association, we're working on issues that uh, are specifically um, affecting our members. And a big one is the tax code. Right. Currently, uh, we have medical cannabis businesses that just want to pay their taxes like any other, but they are uh, unable to take their ordinary deductions uh, because of a, a little known uh, part of the U.S. tax code that says that if you're engaged in criminal drug trafficking, then those expenses cannot be uh, deducted right. under, in your annual tax return. Right. Uh, and now these aren't, as we know, criminal drug traffickers. These are people helping patients in compliance with their state laws. But unfortunately, the IRS is interpreting that as criminal drug trafficking. And so what we're working, uh, we're working So they've with disallowed all their deductions, trying to tax their total... Total gross. Total gross sales. Um, and, you know, Which would put any business out of exactly. business. Exactly. And not to mention, uh, if, if not that, but at least drive the cost of medicine up so patients can no longer afford to buy it. Right. I know market. in my business, I've been in a constant state of audit since about 2005. So I, I can relate to that, definitely. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have another caller. Welcome to the show, caller. Oh, we lost oh. them. If you have a question for us, you can call us here now at 503-288-4448. We'll take questions for our panel. So you're, there's also issues around uh, banking accounts. I know there's a Colorado bank uh, that uh, was offering accounts to cannabis-oriented businesses, and I, again, have been directly affected by that, as we were talking about earlier. But you want to ex discuss that with our audience? Yeah, another issue that is you know, little known, uh, maybe amongst patients and, the, the broad, and certainly among the broader community, is that uh, medical marijuana facilities uh, have a heck of a time finding a bank to to take just to take their 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 money in a checking account, not even looking for loans. Some of these these people just want a place to deposit their money so it's safe and secure. And because of the draconian uh, federal drug laws, uh, we have time after time these medical cannabis uh, businesses are being told to take their business elsewhere by uh, the larger banks and even some of the smaller banks now. And in, in Colorado, uh, we had a situation where recently. A small community bank was actually reaching out to the cannabis community, but then uh, backed off and told hundreds of clients that they needed to, you know, close their accounts and move elsewhere. And what's absurd about this is that 
like I've said, these are businesses that are just trying to be legitimate. They want to, they need to have a checking account in order to write a, a check to pay their fees to their city, their local city governments or their state in the case of Colorado, not to mention to pay their taxes. How are they going to do that without a checking account? So we've sponsored legislation that uh, is, has been authored by Congressman Jared Polis out of Colorado that would carve out an exception for state legal uh, businesses so that uh, they would no longer fear losing uh, access to financial services. And that's uh, been introduced in the House of Representatives uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, and that's one of the uh, initiatives that we have put uh, in the center of, of our legislative platform for the year. You know, I've been directly affected by that. I don't think I've ever discussed it on television, but we might as well go ahead and do so now. In uh, November of uh, 2008, I had been banking, and I'm going to name names, U.S. Bank. U.S. Bank sent me a letter from their president in uh, Kansas City, Missouri in uh, November of uh, 2008 saying they were going to close our accounts. So I called them. I said, why are you closing our accounts? They said, well, I can't tell you that. You're, we're just going to close them. <laughs> I talked to the people at our local branch of U.S. Bank, and they said, we were the largest business at that branch, and we were their best customer, and our employees went in there and opened accounts. But they had only seen it happen once before, and it was a strict club that was involved in prostitution as well. So I, the, they gave me an extension, though, and I went and opened an account at Bank of America. And so in opening that account, we switched over and, and quit using U.S. Bank. Then I just happened to be at Disneyland in March of uh, uh, 2009, about five months later, when I get a call from my office in line trying to get the entry tickets for my, my children and family at Disneyland. And they say they just got an, a letter from Bank of America saying they were going to close our bank account the next day. And we had payroll checks that had just gone out and everything. So uh, I sat down on a bench at Disneyland and stayed on the phone for about four or five hours. I talked to the uh, fraud prevention people and loss prevention people. They said, no, they're not going to close your account. That's not true. I said, well, I got this letter from Charlotte, North Carolina, saying they're going to close our account. And they said, no, that's not going to happen. There's nothing on your account saying it's going to be closed. And I talked to my local branch manager. He said, no, that's not going to happen. The next day, they closed the bank account, and they stamped 17 payroll checks with refer to maker and gave them back to the employees that needed their money and causing them a lot of financial distress. And so I called up the president's office at Bank of America, and I told them, at that point, we had over six figures in the bank, and we'd never had any bounce checks or anything. I told them they were damaging our business, and I was going to sue them, and I was going to win. And if they didn't give me at least 30 days to find another account. And so the Bank of America the next day reopened our account. And so uh, I switched over to Wells Fargo. And I told the people at Wells Fargo that what had happened with U.S. Bank and Bank of America. And they said, well, let's run this up the chain of command. They went to their regional officers and said, okay, you can open accounts here at Wells Fargo. That's not going to happen at Wells Fargo. So I opened accounts there, and last summer, I got a letter from Wells Fargo <laughs> saying they're closing all of our accounts. So I took it in to the, the, the bank officer who'd helped me, a nice guy, and he took it to his managers, and they came back a couple days later and said, well, we've got you taken off of the, quote, dispensary closure list, end quote. Now, they never said why they were closing it. They wouldn't tell me at Bank of America. They wouldn't tell me at U.S. Bank. There wasn't a reason they would give me. I told them, this is like being in the twilight zone. You won't tell me why you're going to close my account. You're just going to close it. You know? But uh, in this case, they told me they had taken me off the Wells Fargo uh, dispensary closure list. And so I haven't had any further further problem and our account still exists there and at a couple of other banks as well. Sounds but like we need a national can of bank. <laughs> right, you go, oh, right. yes, exactly. And so there is I a national law. We need. I agree with you. Well, you're not the first person to suggest mm -hmm. that. I think a, a can of bank would be a very good thing if we could get too. Uh, enough people together to, to form such a thing. Have our own paradigm. How we have that? another caller. Welcome to our show, caller. Hi, would that be me? Yes, it you would. You are the caller. Are the oh, thank you. Um, uh, my, you know, the, the conversation is just going on is on point with uh, the, uh, the question or comment that I want to make. And while I can certainly appreciate uh, the duress that, that uh, any legitimate business uh, would, would suffer at the hands of having their, their, their banking ties uh, uh, cut, 
um, I think it's even there's even a, a, a greater problem, and it seems to be uh, related, at, uh, perhaps even systematic, um, where they are also uh, uh, that is when I say they, I'm talking about uh, federal authorities primarily. This was a position that was articulated by a federal prosecutor here in Oregon, a federal uh, attorney, uh, someone from the attorney general's office who made a, a big point that that uh, notwithstanding any state uh, medical marijuana laws, it still is uh, illegal uh, under federal uh, statutes. And consequently, right. they sent notices out, as you gentlemen, I'm sure, are aware, to various uh, landlords, uh, somewhat indiscriminately, of the businesses involved, they that, went to uh, weed bats the and found all the dispensaries the they could have find listed on uh, one of these websites. I'm sorry? They'd gone to a website uh, and found a list of dispensaries and sent letters to all of those yeah, exactly, locations exactly. and their landlords. Right, and, and you know, and that he happened admitted in California that it was too, a very didn't random it? Several, uh, About practice. a year ago? A couple of years ago. That just happened in Oregon about three months ago, four months ago. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And there was a uh, an arrest con and a conviction uh, on of the poorly named dispensary out in Wake Aloha. and Bake. Yeah, I don't think that's a good medical. Well, name that is no longer in operation, and all of their proprietors are now well, they, on probation. They, the lady who ran it has taken a plea bargain for yes. probation. She that's didn't right. get any jail time. That's true. Well, uh, w would you guys comment on on that? Uh, you know that sort of. Uh, front uh, on the attack against legitimate businesses where they're, they're putting uh, the fear of the federal government coming down on landlords. And, and I think the economy, you, you guys have spoken well about uh, the jobs that have been created, but I think there's also this whole, uh, this whole dimension that there are a lot of storefronts that are going vacant out there. And the idea that uh, uh, a landlord is 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 going to have to face federal prosecution or uh, or civil forfeiture the of their property. Bacon. I'll, I'll, I'll take uh, the comments off the air. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, thanks for your call. Question. You know, Aaron, I know you've dealt with this in California, and and now you've heard about this happening in Oregon. Why don't you? Yeah. That? I mean, this this uh, among other issues are exactly the kind of thing that this industry has come together to to fight against. Uh, you know, we need to continue to push the message forward to the Obama administration and members of Congress and other policymakers that if, if you take action against landlords or write threatening letters uh, preventing medical marijuana laws from being implemented, as is the case in Washington and other states, uh, what you're effectively doing is you're, put, you're shutting down storefronts, you're boarding, you're boarding them up, uh, putting people out of work, and then instead moving that, uh, because the demand's still there, there's still demand for, for marijuana, medical cannabis, and recreational marijuana for that matter, uh, you're moving that demand over into the black market. So now you're enriching Mexican drug cartels, uh, other uh, unsavory individuals who are growing cannabis in the, in the national parks and doing all number of things that none of us want to see uh, happen. So, you know, we, uh, this is a, uh, public relations war, really, with uh, those drug warriors who just are holding on to this old status quo, uh, and those of us who know what the truth is, which is that these are businesses that are not only creating jobs and taking up storefronts and that sort of thing, but are really enhancing their community. And uh, that's why our industry association was formed, in order to put a professional, uh, you know, put our, our professional face out there and let the world know uh, what, you know, what this is really about. All right, we have a question from a studio audience member. If you're here in the Portland area, uh, you can come down to uh, our, our shows every Friday night at 8 o'clock, 8 to 9, and uh, join our studio audience. Go right ahead, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, you kind of touched on that a second ago, that it's also taking business out of town. So it's increasing trafficking, and it's taking the local businesses elsewhere where they can grow in the national parks and out of the country and things like that. If we change the laws, we get that business a lot more localized and keeps our money at home. Very good point. Thank you. Yep. We have a caller uh, standing by. Go ahead, caller. Welcome to the show. Hello, caller. Hello. 
My question is, um, uh-huh. hello, can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear you. you gotcha. You're on. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's a delay on television, so try to listen through the phone rather than the TV. Okay, thank you. And, and so my question is about um, what do you think Jack Hare would say about taxes on anything that has to do with our medical marijuana? You know, Jack proposed a uh, bill in California. He was against federal taxation, especially after so many of us have faced federal prosecution. And, but he favored taxing state taxes akin to wine taxes in the state of California. So he proposed that in his own initiative that some people are circulating in the state of California currently. You know, he passed away on April the 15th, so I think he's, that yeah. alone has a statement in itself. Yeah, on uh, Federal Tax Day. And he yes. gave his last speech at our Hempstock Festival yes. two years ago. And so, you know, we have a video from the Seattle Hemp Fest on uh, Saturday uh, a couple of weeks ago with uh, Seattle Mayor Mike McGinn. 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 Here's Mike McGinn. In my official capacity as mayor, I have a message to all of you out there. Welcome to Seattle! You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, during my campaign, somebody asked me what my position was on marijuana legalization. And what I said was that if every politician and elected official who had ever tried marijuana, voted to legalize it, it would be legal in an instant. It's the truth. It is the truth, folks, that we have, we have been, as a society, very hypocritical. And Rick Steves has spoken about this, and your prior speakers have spoken about this. So we live in a very complicated world right now where attitudes are changing. And that makes it harder on, on lots of folks. It makes it harder on people that want safe access to drugs. It makes it harder, um, you know, on parents who are trying to figure out what their kids to do. Tell, tell their kids what to do. It makes it harder on our police force too, by the way, and I'll talk about that in a second. It makes it harder, but there's a pathway here that'll make it easier, and that pathway is to recognize that prohibition as a strategy has not worked. The war on drugs has not worked. And we can do better. And we're in a time where attitudes are changing. Attitudes are changing, so we just have to keep diligently talking and explaining and, and being authentic to our friends and neighbor and our family members about this issue. And attitudes do change. And we can see attitudes change for the better. You know, on a number of topics, 20 or 30 years ago, you wouldn't even have spoken about the issue of gay marriage to anyone. And that's changed. 20 or 30 years ago, legalization seemed like distant, something way in the distance. And that's changed. Here in the city of Seattle, by popular vote, we went as far as we could go, which is that enforcement of marijuana laws for small amounts, the possession of small amounts is the lowest enforcement priority for our police. Lowest enforcement priority. But you know, on that, the people led. The people led and the politicians followed. Now, by the way, just do us a favor. Do us a favor. Lowest enforcement priority does not mean legal. Make life easier for everybody, including our police officers. Don't light up in front of them. Just make life easier for everybody, please. Okay? But they take the law seriously. In the state of Washington, the people led again. And medical marijuana is legal under state law. Now those laws have changed, they've become more confusing, but the people led. And here in the city of Seattle, we're listening. And we're going to make sure that we do our best to observe that state law, uh, protect the rights of medical marijuana, legitimate medical marijuana users, to safe access to medicine. It's not happening everywhere, it's not happening in every city, but it's happening in our city. Now the problem is of course that our law at the city level, the laws at the state level, all exist in a world where it is still illegal at the federal level. 
And we can't, we can't change that from here with our votes. But we can change more state laws. Both people have spoken to you about initiatives. You know, I mentioned to you two things. The politicians followed because the people led. The initiative here in Seattle to make it the lowest enforcement priority. Medical marijuana. You have to keep leading. You have to keep leading. And I'll do my best as an elected official to lead too. I'll do my best as an elected official to lead too. But we need you to keep leading because if we do that, we will make these laws make sense. We will make this community better. Thank you all of you for your work. Thank you. The mayor of the greatest city in the world, Mayor Mike McGinn, show some love, man. So that was from a couple of weeks ago at the Seattle Hemp Fest, and we'd like you to take the lead. Here in Oregon, you can pick up our Oregon Cannabis Tax Act petition. We have well over 30,000 signatures. We need 87,000 valid voter signatures. We're about a quarter of the way through our campaign. So you can go to that website, CannabisTaxAct.org. It would allow adults to grow their own and sell seeds and starts of all strains of cannabis with no taxation, regulation, or registration. It will allow industrial hemp to be cultivated for fiber, food, fuel, and it would also be without regulation on industrial hemp. And we'd be able to grow the strains of hemp that produce the most uh, and best quality hemp fiber, fuel, and food. It would also regulate the sales to adults through state licensed stores. You could set up a, a bar or coffee shop, something like a brew pub or a winery, if you got the proper licensing and create thousands of jobs, put Oregon on the cutting edge of exciting new economic development. So we urge you to go to CannabisTaxAct.org. You can make a donation there. You can print out a single sheet single signature petition sheet, sign it and mail it to us, or you can fill out the volunteer form and we will mail you a package of petitions. So please go there and uh, donate and help us with our petition drive at Cannabis Tax Act to restore hemp and cannabis. Uh, your website, Aaron, is thecannabisindustry.org? That's right. Uh -huh. uh, www.thecannabisindustry.org. Remember that word, the, in there? I know I forgot <laughs> yeah. it when I was typing it in earlier. Uh, we encourage uh, anybody who's involved in the cannabis industry to uh, go online and uh, become a part of the organization so that we can uh, be stronger as a whole as we, as we fight for these issues uh, on behalf of these businesses. I appreciate your work on that. I'm proud to join now as uh, one of the, the members of your organization as well. Our, the, the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation and our THCF Medical Clinics are doing that. So appreciate your work on Thank that. Thank you. Then we have Dr. Steve Fry. Doctor, your website is Fry with an E, F R Y E for Nevada. Correct. Dot com. That's correct. That's the website for my candidacy. The website, if people want to read about my book, is uh, 2525reasons.org. And the book is sold out. It should be available in a few weeks now in the ebook. The uh -huh. current, the current uh, issue is sold out. I'm rewriting it now because there's been so many major changes with 45,000 deaths in Mexico and the, uh, the Global Commission on Drug Policy, which has uh, endorsed ending the drug war, and the NAACP two weeks ago in L.A. endorsed ending the drug war because it's a failure and racist. So because of so many changes, I'm updating the book, and it'll be available in, in the next few weeks. So what are some of those 25 reasons, Dr. Fry? Well, the first, the first for, and foremost reason is the drug war is a catastrophic, monumental fiasco. It kills more people than drugs. Amen. I mean, that, that one fact alone uh, should solve the problem. And, we, you know, we, we, we're told by our politicians that we wage the drug war for children and teenagers. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, the drug war is a deadly and devastating uh, uh, fiasco for them also. I mean, starting pre-birth when mothers can't get prenatal care because they're afraid they'll lose the babies or be sent to prison so right. they don't get prenatal care. So we get increased uh, spontaneous abortions, increased That's birth defects. Right. Uh, babies born with all kinds of problems because mm -hmm. mothers can't get the kids. Low weight. Then the kids, exactly. Then the kids are born, and we put one or both parents in prison, and the kids are then shipped off to foster care. So I took a medical perspective on that and said, well, what happens in foster care? The kids in foster care have four times the death rate of kids who are not in foster care, plus many times causes great psychological duress. You're taking oh, the kids yes. away from their mothers and That's fathers. Right. It's incredible. Lifelong problems. And then when the kids, if they survive and age out 
of foster care, what do they do? They become drug addicts and street people and alcoholics. The very thing we were trying to prevent, we have perpetuated. Very good point, sir. And our teenagers uh, are, are, are murdered. We have 19 times the teenage murder rate of the Netherlands where drugs have been regulated, taxed, and controlled or legal for 35 years. 19 times the teenage murder rate. If these were white kids being killed, this would have ended a long time ago. I have to agree with you. There's a lot but of they're predominantly in the minority there kids that are being killed. The drug war is a real war. It it's is. an armed conflict. Look what's happened in Mexico. We still lose. 17,000 people every year in the United States, Department of Justice statistics. Nobody talks about that. Mm -hmm. It's a major war. So it's catastrophic for kids. It's catastrophic for adults. Our women, we have more people in prison, children, adults, and women, than any other country in the world, six times as many mm -hmm. per capita as China. Mm -hmm. And we talk about them having human rights issues, and we have six times as many people in prison. 87% of drug incarcerations are simple possession. Not distribution, not growth, simple possession. So how much harm does marijuana do? I want to refer to that nice lady that called in and wanted to know about stigmatization. Marijuana is the safest over-the-counter prescription or a recreational drug in history. You cannot die from pot. There when I go. give talks to medical students and doctors, I say, please, anyone that can provide me one death, I'll give you 50 bucks. I have never opened my wallet. I know Jack Herr had a, a hundred thousand. It started at ten thousand, but he raised it up to a hundred thousand after a number of years. Okay. He knew he was so safe the whole time. He, he knew it wasn't going to happen. Out. <laughs> That's right. And not only that, seven thousand Americans die every year from aspirin and ibuprofen, there and thousands go. more from Tylenol. Bingo. And we have to have a prescription for this. Seven thousand. Well, I wish college. I could vote for you. I wish I could. Me well, too. in Nevada, we'll, we're, we're going to get we're going to get somebody on the ballot that's going to speak nationally for what we have to do to straighten out this country. Not only talking about hemp as as the financial sol solution to our economic and jobs crisis, but the drug war will bring thousands more jobs to this country: growing, manufacturing, transporting, selling. And marijuana is so safe; it's and e even the DEA's own judge Francis yeah. Young. 20 years ago, 1988, more than 20 years ago, mm -hmm. said that it is safer than most foods. That's right. right. And yet, three weeks ago, the DEA says it's a dangerous drug. They They're just still lie. telling us the same they old lies. Lie. Mm -hmm. It's not a dangerous drug. It's not addictive. It's not habit-forming. It's not a gateway drug. As a matter of fact, it's a step-down drug. Exactly. It's used to treat heroin addicts. It's used to treat cocaine addicts. It, it was the treatment of choice for alcoholism yeah. before it was made illegal. That's true. It's a terminal drug. It's not a gateway drug. So each, each of the chapters talks about uh, one aspect. It's a miracle medicine for 25 different diseases with no drug-drug interactions and no downside. You can't die from it. Right. The lady, we, so you your talking, website is 25... 25reasons.org. She called about, you started off the program with talking about how it's good for irritable bowel syndrome, which is very yeah. valuable because that's an annoying condition. Absolutely. What's even more important is Crohn's disease. Yes. Our multiple yes. sclerosis. Ulcerative sclerosis, which is bleeding, it's diarrhea. It's yeah. fabulous treatment for that. It's the treatment of choice for most neurological conditions. It's the best brain drug we got. Right. Alzheimer's, stroke, MS. Has a neuroprotective effect. It's neuroprotective. You right. do not get lung cancer from it. As a matter of fact, it's, it's carcinoprotective. Mm -hmm. Pot smokers who also smoke cigarettes get less lung cancer mm -hmm. than people that just smoke cigarettes. That There's so much misinformation out there that the government has put forth that people are constantly defending how safe and wonderful it is. It's so much safer than alcohol. 6,000 to 7,000 college students die every year. Excuse me, 2,000 college students die every year from alcohol. Mm -hmm. And we will not let them party with pot. That's 2,000 devastated families from good kids that were in college. That's right. Had they been partying with pot, you can't die. They'd still be here. That's they true. would still be here. So your website year. is fry, F-R-Y-E, -E for, for Nevada.com. Nevada. Nevada. And, and that's correct. 25 reasons. 25 org. reasons, that's correct. And that's, that's your book. book. Yes. Uh, we urge you to support Dr. Fry, especially if you're out there in the state of Nevada. We have a caller who's been standing by. Welcome to the show, caller. Hello. Hello. Are you yep. yep, we're tied here. here. Okay. Um, I got, I got some facts for you. These facts are, this is, uh, in the United States, there... You need to turn down your television and... Uh... <laughs> in the United States, in the United States, um, we have more people in prison right now in the United States than we have, than they did in prison 
in the USSR behind a drug war. What are we going to do about that? And are we going to fight for those people's rights when they come out of the prisons to become a citizen again? Out a hassle life over marijuana. All right. We, we certainly are working for that. Thanks for your call. We, uh, of course, are working to end marijuana prohibition here in Oregon. There's uh, two initiatives in Washington that are working to that end. There's talk about it in, uh, in uh, California. There's an initiative in circulation in Colorado, maybe in Nevada. I'm not sure what MPP is doing. Maybe you can tell us, Aaron. But did you want to talk? And I want to talk about prison. People like, pr prison uh, is a major catastrophe. One third of prisoners are dead by age 45, and two thirds are rearrested within three years. Right. So we clearly accomplish nothing except waste governmental money in prison. And if we can't even keep drugs out of prison, if we can't keep drugs, hundreds of tons of drugs, drugs from crossing into the country every single year, and we can't even keep drugs out of our guarded prisons, please tell me how we're ever going to keep them off the streets. We cannot do it. it hasn't happened yet. And it's never going to happen. It's not. We have the highest drug use of any country in the world. We have 5% of the world's population, and after 70 years of prohibition and 40 years of a drug war, with 5% of the world's population, we now use 60% of all the world's drugs, more than the rest of the world combined. But the government keeps telling us we're winning the drug war. Well, that's obviously <laughs> a lie. I appreciate your work on this. We're going to have our little show and tell Strong segment stage. here. Thank you. We'll start oh, with the absolutely. official well hemp stock of hemp stock. This is the base of this uh, mayo plant. The outer bark is the bast fiber, and that's used for canvas, rope, lace, and linen. The interior herd fiber had traditionally been a waste product from uh, production of the, the bark and it was used for animal bedding, but a study by the United States Department of Agriculture said this is four times more productive than the most productive tree species. So an acre of hemp can produce five to 10 tons of this bast fiber and 25 to 30 tons of this herd fiber every year. And another product from that is seeds. According to a study out of Notre Dame, seed uh, production is about 8,000 pounds a year from feral hemp in the United States at about 3%. THC and that seed can be pressed and you'll get 300 gallons of biodiesel fuel or, or healthy oil and after you press that 8,000 pounds you have that 300 gallons of oil and uh, 6,000 pounds of high protein hemp seed meal and incidentally hemp protein is, meets human nutritional needs exactly. It uh, produces the eight amino acids that humans need in their protein diet in perfect balance for human health. Over here we have a couple of antique bottles. Here's one. It's still still full. This is circa 1910. It's uh, a medic mentholated cough balsam from Clay Shaw of uh, uh, West Virginia. And it came in its bottle here. And then right next to it we have another uh, cough and cold remedy that also contains cannabis. Bliss native balsam for coughs and colds. I hear a few coughs in the audience here. This is a flyer for the National uh, Cannabis Industry Association that Aaron Smith is here uh, representing. You can go to the cannabis uh, industry, industry.org. Industry and you have a couple of items there do. tonight, don't you, Tim? Well, here's, uh, let's see here, this is a, a copy of The Normal Life, a movie that has just come out about two weeks ago, produced by Doug Ross and Rod Pittman. And it is uh, also, I appear in it. You as appear do, in it and you uh, play the music. And I it's do. got shots from our THCF Medical Gardens does, as well. Yeah. And so anyway, that, that's come out. And uh, we understand some folks were looking for it. If you'd like to find out where to get that, you go to www.cinemalibrestudio.com. That's C-I-N-E-M-E. A L I B R E studio. And I'm sure they have it at Amazon.com as well, just like yes. everything else. Yeah. And you have Vivian's new book. I have Vivian's new book. In fact, I understand Vivian will be coming to to our hip. He'll be on our show next Stop. week. And he'll be on our show next week, and he'll, hopefully he'll bring plenty of copies of this because it is a great book. Uh, it's Protestable. Just beautiful. It's Protestable. about the 20th, 20 years of the. Seattle Hemp Fest. We've been doing it a long time. And here are a couple of books as well. And what do you got here? Well, this one here uh, is a phenomenal book. That's a that new I book. I haven't seen hemp, that before. Hemp for Victory, named after the hemp uh, movement in World War II that temporarily right. Great movie. Uh, set aside the, uh, the hemp prohibition so that we could make hemp rope and stuff for the Navy. 
That's by Richard Davis, a long time activist Davis. down there. And it's called Hemp of Victory, the Trillion Dollar Crop. Hemp can turn the economic problems of oh, this yeah. country around. We'll create hundreds of thousands of jobs, U.S. jobs that cannot be sent overseas, can reduce our dependence upon foreign oil, mm -hmm. can reverse global warming because it's a plant. And you talked about the, 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 the phenomenal uh, stock you have there. We could get three to four cycles a year and it replenishes the soil. Hemp is absolutely incredible for, for so much. 25,000 different products from oil, paper, wood, concrete to lipstick and, and shampoo. And this can make a huge difference, and it's exactly what Obama needs to be talking about this week. That's true. To solve the problems of this country's jobs and economy, all it would take, or no, I shouldn't say all, but a single act of Congress to get rid of the prohibition against hemp. And you cannot get high on hemp, and you cannot make food and fuel out of marijuana, cannabis. They're two different species, and, and they're different enough that one cannot do what the other does. So there's no downside to uh, legalizing hemp. And I think it's something that we ha have to have A number do. of states, including Oregon yes. and North Dakota, have uh, legalized hemp. But uh, you can only get seeds from a French company right. that are patented. And you can only import those from France if you and have a permit a from the DEA. Yeah, that is correct. Right. Right. So and I just came, uh, I live in Las Vegas now. I was at the National Clean Energy Symposium two days ago, four days ago, this past Tuesday in Las Vegas. 400 people attended, Vice President uh, Biden, Senator Harry Reid, Secretary of Energy Chu. In the entire day, not one person mentioned hemp. So I decided it's a four-letter word, and it must be obscene because we can't discuss it in public. It must be. <laughs> you know, we have a caller who's been standing by. Let's go ahead and take that call. Welcome to the show, caller. Hello, caller. Yeah, I'm traveling to Nevada here shortly, and I was wondering how to take my medicine. You know, uh, Nevada is not a state that has reciprocity. So you won't be legal in the state of Nevada. In fact, Nevada's medical marijuana law is among the nation's most complex. First, you have to pay a $50 fee to the health department. It used to be the agriculture department. But they switched it back to the health department. That makes more sense. After paying that $50, no, first you pay your $50 oh, okay. fee. Then you go to your doctor and you get your fingerprints. And then you send your fingerprints and these uh, forms in with another fee of $150. And so you've paid 200 at this point. You mail that into the health department, then they mail you back a letter. You take that letter to the DMV and pay 12 more dollars, and then they print you a card. So it's a very complicated program in the Plus state of Nevada. Plus the dollars to pay to the doctor to get the letter of approval. Not, it depends on the doctor, of course. Right. But yeah, the doctor charges something as well, obviously. So. Oh, but, uh, you know, we are counting down our time here. Aaron, I'd like you to, to talk a little bit more about how businesses and others can get involved in the CannabisIndustry.org and the National Cannabis Industry Association. Uh, visit our website that we've said a few times, the CannabisIndustry.org. Uh, there's lots of information on there about uh, the campaigns that we're working on as well as how to join the association. Um, our memberships uh, are for businesses, uh, but for individuals who are out there uh, watching, uh, if you're a patient and you uh, frequent a medical cannabis collective or dispensary, uh, ask them, are they part of the industry association? And uh, if they're not, ask them, well, why not? Because, you know, we need to come together and work for this common cause. And that's, you know, really what this is about is that we are greater than the sum of our parts uh, together. And uh, look forward to uh, coming on the show again. Uh, thanks yeah, so much for the opportunity to, to Portland, talk too. about uh, the work that we're doing. Great. And Dr. Stephen Fry, your website is Fry with an E, F R Y E for Nevada dot com. Correct. And you're running for the United States Congress that in a correct. new it's district a, in Nevada. Where they, uh, will we're you not be representing sure which one Las yet. Vegas. I will be representing one of. There'll be three districts in Las Vegas, and I'll be running in one of those. You do not have to live in the exact district when you run for Congress. You just have to live in the state. I see. And so I I've see. been in Nevada now for uh, almost 12 years, so I'm fully mm -hmm. qualified, and I was a professor in the medical school there, so. That gives me additional credentials, so it's going to be very exciting. And I'm just astounded by the amount of support I'm getting, that, that people are no longer arguing with me about the legitimacy of legalizing drugs. And I'm talking about legalizing all drugs, not just marijuana. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you legalize them, drug side. use goes way down. 
Your book's name again? We Really Lost This War, 25 Reasons to Legalize Drugs. And the website for that? It's 25reasons.org. The digits 25reasons.org. Reasons.org. So you want to check that out for certain. And when you legalize uh, drugs, the main point is drug use goes down. Addiction goes down. Drug overdose deaths goes way down. Hepatitis maybe. goes down and AIDS goes down and crime goes way down. And so nothing we are goes working up. to legalize cannabis here in the state of Oregon with an initiative petition. We are have over 30,000 signatures. We need 87,000 valid registered Oregon signatures, valid registered Oregon voter signatures. So we urge you to go to that website, cannabistaxact.org, and. Uh, get involved. You can donate there, you can print a petition and sign it and mail it in to us, or you can fill out the volunteer form and we'll mail you petitions so you can get signatures from your family and friends. One final point is if you are a loved one or looking for a doctor who can help you qualify for medical marijuana, we have doctors all over the United States from Michigan to out in Hawaii, including here in the great Northwest. So go to our website, hemp.org, that's H-E-M-P dot O-R-G, or you can call us at 1-800-723-0188. I want to thank you for watching. We're going to go out with some more music with Tim Pate. We'll be back next week for show number 600, and we're at our 15th anniversary as well. Thanks for watching. Remember to help us restore hemp. Nice.